Open your Bibles this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And I have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so I'm not going to ask you to turn to every passage of Scripture that I'm going to be needing to make this message clear today. I'm going to be putting everything up here, and if it's not up here, I will read it as we go along, just for the sake of time and brevity, because if I wait for everyone to turn to their individual passages of Scripture, it will take a long time to preach this message. So, suppose that a person has come under conviction of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden he becomes concerned about the destiny of his eternal soul. soul. He wonders where he's going to spend eternity. So he decides to invite several preachers from several denominations to explain to him what he must do to go to heaven because he says to himself, finding out how to get to heaven certainly cannot be that difficult. I mean, with all these preachers around, you know, I'll be able to get an answer to that question. So he asks these preachers to join him, and when they gather together, he asks them this simple question. What do I have to do to go to heaven? Well, Mr. Fundamentalist immediately says, well, that's very easy. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how easy that is? The Catholic raises his hand and says, Hold on a minute. Sir, you did not tell him everything. Why don't you read him James chapter 2 and verse 24? Well, the fundamentalist is not afraid to read a passage from the Word of God. So he opens his Bible to James 22 and he says, You know that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And that poor unsaved man bends his eyebrows in confusion and scratches his head and goes, Huh? So, the Church of Christ preacher chimes in. And he says, now wait a minute. You, too, did not tell him everything he needs to know about salvation. Sir, wouldn't you like to know what Jesus Christ has to say about salvation? And so he reads in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So you see, sir, Jesus Christ says that baptism is necessary to be saved. And not only that, Peter, his own apostle, said... And said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Could anything be plainer than that? And as they're talking, the Pentecostal chimes in, and he says, Now, sir, they told you some things, but they did not tell you everything. Suppose that you did everything that all of these pre preachers have just told you. How would you know that you're saved? Don't you want to know what Jesus Christ has to say about that? He says, absolutely, I want to know. He says, well, Jesus Christ said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So you see, sir, if you're really saved... These signs will follow you. This is the proof that you are saved. Could anything be plainer than that? That unsaved man sits there, more confused than when they began, and now he's thinking to himself, why in the world did I ever invite all these people into my home? <laughs> and he looks at every single one of them and he says, you're all crazy. Get out of my house. And unless somebody comes along and fixes this for that man, he will die and go to hell because they did not give him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the amazing thing is this. They were all quoting from the same Bible. They were all quoting scripture. And the question is this. How could they all have been quoting from the same Bible and all saying something different? to the same man. 
Another question that we have to ask ourselves is why are there so many denominations in the world? They're all using the same Bible, and yet they all come to a different conclusion as to how a person can be saved and what God requires for salvation. So as I begin this morning, I want to read a verse of Scripture. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 27. And it said, And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. Now you will know that this Samuel is a prophet of God. And this Saul is God's king. Disobedient, but nevertheless, he's God's king. And you know why Samuel asked Saul to ask his servant to pass on? Is because Samuel wanted Saul's undivided attention. Because Samuel then said this, but stand thou still a while. In other words, you, Saul, stand still a while. You stay right there. Why? That I may show thee the word of God. The biggest problem that confronts Christianity today is people don't believe what they read in the Bible. People don't believe the words they see on the page. Today, people rely on their pastors. That's when the only thing a person knows about the Bible is what their pastor knows about the Bible, and they're relying on him to teach them what the Bible says, and they're relying on him to teach them how to get to heaven. Should a man's reliance be upon a pastor? or a church, or a denomination, or a creed. I mean, it's a fact that pastors today teach what they were taught in Bible school. And if it, they didn't learn it in Bible school, then certainly it mustn't be right. Because our denomination definitely has the right answer. You know, I've heard people say, as I shared with them truth like this about the Word of God rightly divided, I never heard that before. And what they're implying is, my pastor doesn't teach that, therefore what you're saying must be wrong. So, where should a person's allegiance be? Should it be a pastor, a church, a denomination, or a creed? No, your allegiance should be to a book. Your allegiance should be to the Word of God. The divinely inspired Word of God, and in this church, that happens to be the King James Bible. So, if your allegiance is in the wrong place, if your allegiance is to a man, or to a church, or a denomination, stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the Word of God. You're in 2 Timothy? I asked you to find 2 Timothy. There's one verse in your Bible that tells you to study your Bible. And then it tells you how to study your Bible. Notice it says study. Not a request. Not a suggestion. A command. Study. To show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know this is not a, a very intelligent question, but is there anybody here who does not want to be approved by God? You want to be approved by God, right? There isn't a person here who, does not want, who wants to go to the judgment seat of Christ and be ashamed because they did not obey God's method of studying his Bible. Notice Paul ends this verse by saying, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, this whole book is the word of truth. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22 verse 21, this entire book is the word of truth, but it's not all your truth. 
Not everything in that book belongs to you. As you'll see today, some things belong to Israel. Some things belong to the body of Christ. And that's why it must be rightly divided. To rightly divide means to cut straight. You have to cut it where it needs to be cut. And you have to cut it straight. It's like when you have a cake and you're going to cut. You're going to rightly divide those pieces. If you're honest, you're going to rightly divide them. If you're not honest, somebody else, somebody's not going to get what they're supposed to get. <laughs> See, you have to do the same thing with the Word of God. It must be rightly divided. Now, God inspired Paul to write these words. These are not Paul's idea. He didn't come up with this. So this must be a great idea. Let me write this verse in here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, if God inspired Paul to write this, do you suppose that God also inspired Paul how to rightly divide, to show us how to rightly divide the word of truth? Yeah, God showed Paul how to rightly divide the word of truth. So we're going to take a look at that today. I will put the verses up here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, Paul said, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel <clears throat> and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 11 speaks of time past. Verse 12 speaks of at that time. In other words, there was a time when we Gentiles had no part in the economy of God. We were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, without God, having no hope, without God in the world. That's time past. And then in verse 13, Paul says, But now, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So the word of God takes us from time past to but now. In other words, there is a place in the Word of God where time past stops and but now begins. There is a line of demarcation in your Bible that inevitably time has to stop. Time past must stop and but now begins. We'll look at that today. But in Ephesians chapter 2, you also have verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So now in this verse, you have ages to come. So we have time past, but now, and ages to come. Now I will quickly draw a timeline that maps out the entirety of the word of God for you and don't blink because you'll miss it so this takes us from genesis into the gospels where jesus christ died was buried ascended the first chapters of the book of acts they stone stephen god saves paul the rapture the seven-year tribulation the millennial reign of christ time passed but now ages to come that in your bible is god's timeline Every single book in your Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is in perfect order, and every single one of these sections designates a specific period of time in the Word of God, and each one of these periods ends with something that characterizes that period so that you can know that you've reached the end of that particular period, and a new period begins. We'll look at those today. It's not even guesswork here. There's no guesswork involved in this whatsoever. Okay? So, as we begin, stand thou still a while 
that I may show thee the word of God. So what I will do is I will magnify this first section from Genesis to Malachi. That is the history of Israel, how God dealt with Israel, and we'll begin there. Now, something very important happens before um, Genesis chapter 11 and, and, the, and the history of Israel begins. So what I will do is magnify this section first, from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11. In the first three chapters of Genesis, you have the creation of the, of the universe, the world, and everything that God made, the fall of man. You move forward to Noah's flood, and God was really upset with man, like he had said in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that the thoughts of men were only evil continually. And then you finally you reach the Tower of Babel, and the whole world is a mess. One thing you can be absolutely certain of is that from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11, man has been on a downward spiral. Man is not the product of evolution getting better and better and better. Man is the product of devolution, getting worse and worse and worse. Did not Jesus Christ say, and evil men shall wax worse and worse? That's the history of humanity. Today, men would love to present men as getting better and better and better and eventually reaching godhood. That's not what the Bible teaches. As we reach this point in human history, there is one group of people in the whole world, and they're all Gentiles. There is no Jacob, there's no David, there's no Solomon, no Moses, no John the Baptist, no Peter, James, or John, and there certainly is no Apostle Paul, and there is no dispensation of grace, and there is no gospel of grace, and there is no body of Christ. The body of Christ does not exist. Matter of fact, as we move through this, it will be, it's wise for us to always take note of why the body of Christ cannot exist here yet. It's wise for us to, look, to, to do that because what we're really striving for today is to arrive at the conclusion where time past ends and but now begins. Because but now only begins, the body of Christ only begins with but now. Anything before but now is time past. And in time past, we had no part in anything to do with Israel. So there's only one group of people in the world, and he says then the whole world was of one language and of one speech. And in Genesis chapter 11, God scatters them over all the world, and he confounds their language. At this juncture in the word of God, this is the condition of the world as we get to Genesis chapter 11. Now God looks down on this mess. He looks down on this mess that existed all the way till Genesis chapter 11. He says, you know what? I'm either going to destroy this place again, or I'm going to have to do something to save all these people. Now remember, there are no Jews, no Israel, nothing until Genesis chapter 11. They're all Gentiles. Adam was a Gentile. Everybody are Gentiles. So what does God do? God looks down, and he looks down and he spots one man called Abraham. He says he calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And he, and he makes Abraham a promise. And the promise is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And the Lord said, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Abraham left this. Abraham left this. And God called him out of this country. And he says, I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now in light of these verses, this is where God begins to create the nation of Israel. This is where it began. And God is so serious about his relationship 
with this group of people that he makes a covenant exclusively with them. That covenant is the covenant of circumcision and it's found in Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 14. I will not read all those verses. But in the, this, this section right here, chapter 1, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 14, ends with those who are not circumcised will be cut off. And God makes a, a, a difference between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Okay? Somebody who is an uncircumcised person cannot just come and say, Hey, I want to belong to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He has to go through some. He has to go through the rite of circumcision in order to do that. Now, in light of this truth, that there are now two groups of people in the world, you can better understand this verse. Wherefore, remember that be ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So the circumcision is Israel. The uncircumcision is the Gentiles, and Israel used to call them names. They called them the uncircumcision. It was a, you know, they looked down upon them. So, the thing that characterizes Genesis to Malachi is this truth. The middle wall of partition. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talked about the middle wall of partition. So it's very important at the outset of, of this message that you understand a principle that is associated with the middle wall of partition. As long as that wall exists, it will separate the circumcision from the uncircumcision. Whenever you have a difference between Israel, the Jews, and the circum uncircumcision, the Gentiles, you cannot have the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ today is made up of Jews and Gentiles, for there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles today. So if you don't have the body of Christ, you don't go to these books to get your doctrine, because although this is for you, it's not to you. The whole Bible is for you, but the whole Bible is not to you. And that's the problem today with Christianity is that they think that the whole Bible is to them without making any distinction as to who it was written to. That's always the wrong way to approach the Bible. So, when God makes a distinction between these two groups of people, it's a distinction that should never be violated. You cannot violate this. If you violate this, you violate God's, what, what God is doing, okay? Now, so serious is God about this distinction that he will not allow you to miss that this distinction exists if you read the Word of God. In order to miss this, you willfully have to reject the verses that we're going to read right now. Because if you just read your Bible, Suppose someone who's not, who just got saved, who has no idea what religion is about, has no idea what Christianity is about, knows now that Jesus Christ died for him, that he was buried, he rose again, he believes that, he trusts in his blood to forgive him of all his sins, and he gets saved. And they give him a King James Bible. He doesn't know anything. Well, as he starts, as he starts reading from Genesis 1 and he reads through, you know what? He's not going to come to the conclusion that the body of Christ exists back here. He's not going to come to that conclusion. Unless somebody tampers with his brain, he will not come to that conclusion. Because it's not possible. So, I want you to see how clear the different... The, how clear God shows that there is a difference and a distinction between the circumcision, Israel, and the rest of the world, the uncircumcision. In time past. In time past, not today. In time past, there was a distinction. So I'm going to read some verses for you. I'm not going to put them on the board. I'm going to put the references on the board. For example, Exodus chapter 11, verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel... Shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, 
that ye may know that the, how, the, how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God put a difference. Now, Egypt is a type of the world. This is Egypt. This is Israel. Exodus chapter 9, verse 3. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is in the children, children's of Israel. So God even separated their animals. Not just Israel. He separated their animals from, from the heathen's animals. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 22 to 26. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things and therefore I abhorred them. I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. I will give it unto you to possess it. A land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God which have separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth upon the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean, and ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, listen, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine." God severed. You know what that word means? If you put somebody, lay somebody down on a guillotine, and the guillotine comes down and chops their head off, you have just severed their head from their body. I think that's the most graphic illustration that I could give you to explain what the word severed means, okay? That's what Israel did. That's what God did for Israel. He severed them from the nations. That's how intense this middle wall of partition is. You see that? Also, Numbers 23, verse 9, from the top, from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Deuteronomy, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. For thou didst, didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt. He says, For thou didst separate them from among all the people. Deuteronomy 14.2 For thou art an holy people unto the, Lord, unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon all the earth. So not only were they severed, but they were a special people for God. And they were not to be mixed with the other people of the world. So now time pass has to do with the law. He gave them laws. He gave them commandments to obey. He didn't give the Gentiles that. Okay. Also, everything that happens with Israel is the subject of prophecy. Another principle that we have to keep in mind as we look at this is that whenever you're under the law, the body of Christ cannot exist. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So as long as they're under the law, another principle is that whenever you have prophecy, the church is not the subject of prophecy. The body of Christ is not the subject of prophecy. The body of Christ was a secret hidden God while all these things were happening back here. There was a secret that was hidden God that would not be revealed until one Saul of Tarsus would be saved later on. So the middle wall of partition yells, yells that out to everyone in the world. Israel is separate from you. You are not part of them and they are not part of you. So, this section is Genesis chapter 1 to verse 11 and then all the way to Malachi. 
Now the next section that we'll look at, okay, because we just looked at this, the next section that we'll look at is Matthew to John. The four Gospels. Okay? And notice that we're still in time past. We haven't come to but now yet. When you enter into Matthew's Gospel, okay, when you enter into Matthew's Gospel coming in from the Old Testament, you are entering into an Old Testament village where the synagogue is in full operation. The high priest is functioning. The blood of bulls and goats is being shed every single day. The sacrificial system is in full operating mode. You're entering into an Old Testament village. I know in your Bible at the end of Malachi it says the New Testament. God didn't put that there. Man put that there. You're not entering into the New Testament when you enter into the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What separates the Old Testament from the New is the 400 years of silence. God did not speak for 400 years. God breaks that silence with the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist introduces Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ calls his 12 disciples. There are still two groups of people in the world. Israel, the circumcision. Gentiles, the uncircumcision. What does the Word of God say about what Jesus Christ was doing here in these days? What was He doing in these days? Well, we read in Romans chapter 15 and verse 8 that Jesus Christ, now I say that Jesus Christ was. He was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises uh, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Notice this verse says, Jesus Christ was. He was something. If that's what he was, what is he today? Today, he is the resurrected, glorified head of the body of Christ. That's what he is today. But when he was this, what was he? He was a minister of the circumcision. That's what he was. Do you know what that means? That he was a minister of the circumcision? Well, let me put it like this. If you go to the Lutheran church down the street, they have a minister. He's a minister of the Lutheran church. You go to the Pentecostal church over there, they have a minister there. He's the minister of the Pentecostal church. You go to the Methodist church over there, and they have a minister there. He's the minister of that Methodist church. You come here, you have a minister. I'm the minister of, I minister to the people at Grace Bible Community Church. Jesus Christ was, past tense, the minister of the circumcision. That's what he was. Do you know what that means? If Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision and not the minister of the uncircumcision, it means that the middle wall of partition still exists. And as long as the middle wall of partition still exists, you cannot have the body of Christ. The body of Christ did not exist here. Let me ask you this. Is there a way to validate this truth? Is there a way to substantiate and prove this truth that the middle wall of partition still existed in the four Gospels? Because let's face it, today in modern day Christianity, they believe that the Gospels belong to the body of Christ. Matter of fact, all of their teaching is from the Gospels. Especially Matthew. Is there a way to validate that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ said, Don't go here. We have something to do with them first. Okay. He also said in Matthew 15, 24, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
in Luke 19, 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him full, fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to his house for as much, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus because he was a son of Abraham. And the promise was made to Abraham way back here. I will make of thee a great nation. And through thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. But they have to, get, they have to become right with God in order for that blessing them be fulfilled. And that time hasn't arrived yet. There's still a middle wall of partition there. And then, of course, in John chapter 4, verse 22, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. They knew what was going on back there. But salvation was of the Jews, but they were not ready to fulfill that position yet. Okay? They had not received their Messiah. As a matter of fact, they're getting ready to kill him. They're getting ready to reject him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So when we reach the end of the Gospels, the Jews and the Gentiles are still separated and the church, the body of Christ, cannot exist. It cannot. It does not exist. So, this verse from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 still applies when you arrive at the, in the Gospels. Because you're still in time past. You see that? You're still in time past. So, before we magnify this section, there's an important parable before we get, like, Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 7, okay, which is right here. Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 7. Before I magnify that, there is a parable that explains this period of time right here. And it's found in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 6. And it said, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came, that's Jesus Christ, and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser, that's God, of his vineyard. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. The three years is the ministry of Jesus Christ. He comes seeking fruit on the fig tree. He says, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Oh boy, what a mess they were. Satanic, demonically possessed Pharisees and high priests. In total rebellion against God. He didn't find any fruit. Right? What a mess they were. He said, cut it down. God, cut them down. Take them off the face of the earth. Why cumbereth it the ground? They're just a waste on the, on the earth. And he answering, God answering him, Lord, let it alone this year. Let it alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, after that year, then that, that thou shalt cut it down. That one year period of time, then after that, after this one year, that one year period of time is of the utmost importance in understanding the word of God rightly divided. One, probably the most confusing section of Scripture for most people in Christianity today is the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. Assumptions that are made about th those verses is unbelievable. So, as I magnify the early parts of, of the book of Acts here, I want us to get an understanding of what's going on, okay? 
When we reach the end of the four Gospels, Jesus Christ dies, he's buried, he ascends, he rises to heaven. Acts chapter 2, he sends the Holy Spirit back. Okay? Many people think the church started there. That the body of Christ started there. But here's what most people don't understand. From the death of Jesus Christ to the end of Acts chapter 7 is a one year period of time. Exactly one year. If you have a study Bible, a good study Bible will have dates in it. And you'll find the dates. And you'll see A.D. 33, and then you get to Acts chapter 7, it changes to A.D. 34. So one year period of time. And according to the parable that we just looked at, that Jesus Christ spoke to Israel, they have exactly one year to get their house in order. You got one year to get your house in order. After that, thou shalt cut them down. Here. Not here. So now I want you to notice carefully the separation between Israel and the Gentiles in these first chapters of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, he says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So now they're talking about a kingdom, restoring a kingdom. Where would that have come from? Well, when John the Baptist came on this, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ came down from the Mount of Temptation. Matthew 4, 17, first, word, first words out of his mouth in his earthly ministry to Israel. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He came down and he said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. He came to us, give them their kingdom and establish their kingdom so that they could fill the promise that was made to Abraham that they would be a blessing to all the people in the world. So they're, now they're asking him, after his death, he rises from the dead. He stays with them for 40 days. And he, they ask him, is it time for the kingdom now? Our kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, not ye men of Egypt, not you men of the Gentiles, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel spoke what was happening right now in Acts chapter 2. It, when the Holy Spirit comes down, these people are speaking in tongues. They're speaking in different languages. Well, Joel prophesied way back here that the, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out one day on, on Israel. And, and Peter here says, that which is happening now is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, if Joel spoke it, you know it can't have anything to do with the church, the body of Christ, because the church, the body of Christ, was a secret hidden God back here. And the church is not the subject of prophecy. It is just not the subject of prophecy. It is a secret. There's a day when it will be revealed. But that has not come yet. So Joel is talking about prophecy. And then in, in, in Acts chapter 2, again, verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Ye men of Israel. In verse, chapter 3, verse 12, And when Peter saw it, he said unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? And then in Acts chapter 3, verses 24 through 26 yea and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days so all the prophets that spoke from Samuel and those that came after Samuel and all that spoke they prophesied of these days well if they prophesied of these days 
we know they weren't talking about the church, the body of Christ. I know somebody's going to hear this. Go, well, I'm going to go find in the old. I'm going to find the church in the Old Testament. I'm. It's not there. The church is not there. The church shows up, but it's not there. You can go and try to read into it. You can spiritualize things and make it look like it's there, but it's not there. There's a middle wall of partition. As long as Jews and Gentiles are separated, you don't have the body of Christ because the body of Christ is made up of Jews and Gentiles. It always is. He goes, yeah, uh, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have foretold of these days, ye are the children of the prophets. You know what, you members of the body of Christ right now? Ye are not the children of the prophets. You are not. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's what Jesus Christ came to do in Israel. He came to get them to repent and turn them away from their iniquities, but they killed him. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. And now he's giving them a one-year extension of mercy. Here's the one-year extension of mercy, and it only has to do with Israel at all times. In Acts chapter 4, and Annas, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, Peter and John, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? They healed a man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. You see who he's talking to? He's talking to a certain group of people here. He's not talking to anybody else. You're not in there. Not one of you is included in these conversations. If this was written to you as members of the body of Christ, he wouldn't be calling you, hey, you leaders of the house of Israel. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means... He is made whole, well, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here whole. He's talking to Israel only. And then in Acts chapter 5, Peter said, 529 to 31. Then Peter said, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers, our fathers, Abraham's not your father, raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him God, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, notice, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then chapter 6, Acts chapter 6 focuses on Jerusalem and Moses. And then in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7 verses 51 to 60, are referring to the fathers who resisted the Holy Spirit. And in verse 51, P Stephen says, You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. This is the end of the seven year period. They stoned Stephen. And this is where Israel fell. This is where the lightning came down on them. This is where in that parable says, and then after that, thou shalt cut them off. There. 
We read in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, Have they stumbled that they should fall? Oh, God forbid. No. See, they stumbled at the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that the cross is a stumbling cross. A stumbling. They stumbled at the cross. But a stumble is not a fall. You can recover yourself from a stumble. You know, you've caught your foot somewhere. You, went, you didn't fall. Have they stumbled that they should fall? No. God gave them one year to repent of the murder of their king after they stumbled. They did not stumble so that they could fall. They stumbled and were given an opportunity to repent of the murder of their king. But rather than repent, at the end of the one year period where he dug about it and he, dug, and, he gave, and he tried to fertilize it and tried to do whatever he could to get them to repent, they stoned Stephen. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. We'll look at that in a moment. But when did salvation come to the Gentiles? Before the fall or after the fall? Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. It was after they stoned Stephen that we read about the fall of Israel later from the, Paul, the pen of Paul. Now listen to this, okay? We have gone all the way from Genesis to the end of Acts chapter 7. And do you know what we find? The middle wall of partition is still there. It hasn't moved. God built that wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down the wall! And he did. That's not the wall you can tear down. God built this wall. God separated his people. And God, through all those centuries, Jesus Christ looked at Israel and said, Oh, how often would I have gathered you? How often would I have gathered you as a chicken gathers her chicks? But ye would not. Now your house is left unto you desolate. And on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. He wasn't saying forgive all the Gentiles for all their sins. It's not what he was doing at that moment in time. He was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And there is forgiveness for the sin of ignorance. Under the old economy. There is a sacrifice for the sin of ignorance. And because there was, he said, Father, forgive them. They were granted one more year to come back to God. So a simple rule of biblical interpretation that we talked about is when the middle wall of partition exists, you cannot have the body of Christ. It cannot be there. The body of Christ did not start in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Pentecost was the fulfillment of a Jewish feast that Israel had been practicing for over 1,500 years. And it was fulfilled that day. Now, we also know this, that God has not spoken to the Gentiles for 4,000 years. We also know that from here to here, the Gentiles were separated. The Gentiles were separated from Israel. And that maintained all the way to there. We also know from Paul's epistles that while everything was going on here, that there is a secret that is hidden God. 
that will never be revealed until one Saul of Tarsus gets saved on the road to Damascus. When God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, there's a secret hidden God. When God speaks to David, there's a secret hidden God. When God breaks the silence with John the Baptist, there's a secret that's hid in God. In Acts chapter 2, with the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, with Peter preaching, there is a secret that is hidden God. Peter stood up and spoke to, spoke to all those people. There is a secret that is hidden God. You remember the verses in Ephesians 2, that at that time, in time past, you were without Christ. And then verse 13, but now, but now, when does but now begin? But now begins after the fall of Israel. When God saves Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the mighty apostle to the Gentiles and gives him the revelation of a secret that had been hidden God for ages and for generations, but now is made known to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Israel's promise was Christ on a throne. You is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, the, the mystery that God reveals to Paul was hid for ages and for generations. In other words, they didn't know it here. Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 says, which in other ages was not made known. It was not made known. But all of a sudden, God saved Saul of Tarsus and gave him the revelation of the mystery. And for the first time in 4,000 years, the first time in 4,000 years, somebody says, I speak to you Gentiles. For the first time, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul is now speaking to the Gentiles. For the first time, after 4,000 years of silence and excluding the Gentiles, you're finally brought in. And then... The church is going to be caught out of here. This dispensation will end. The church will be caught out of here. They'll go into Daniel's 70th week. And God, where he postponed his prophetic dealings with Israel, is going to begin his prophetic dealings with Israel after this has gone out of here. The dispensation of grace began with the secret appearing of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus to the Apostle Paul, and it will end with the secret appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds to catch the church out of here. That's how it's going to, that's how it's all going to end. And then at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus Christ will return, destroy the armies of the Antichrist, set up his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. That's what is called the ages to come in Ephesians 2.7. That is the subject of Hebrews through Revelation. This is how your Bible is divided. It's divided with Israel, the body of Christ, and Israel again. Israel is the subject of prophecy. The body of Christ is the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret back here. The body of Christ leaves. God deals with Israel again. And this is the subject of prophecy again. And whenever you have prophecy, you never have the body of Christ. Ever. They cannot coexist. They're like oil and water. Prophecy is like oil and water to the body of Christ. They can't be mixed. And then, what if, what if Israel had not stoned Stephen? What if they had received their Messiah? I have a message called, Bind the Sacrifice, that talks about what would have happened had they not stoned Stephen. Well, had they not stoned Stephen, this dispensation of grace would not be here. The timeline would look like this. That's what it would look like. Daniel back here prophesied, that the Messiah would come, that he would be cut off, that they would go through this time, that they would go through Daniel's 70th week, that there'd be the millennial reign of Christ. And the promise that was made to Abraham was made back here that he would be a blessing to the whole world. Had they not stoned Stephen over here, that promise would have been fulfilled way out here in the millennial reign of Christ. There would have been no need for a dispensation of grace had they not stoned Stephen. But they did stone Stephen. 
And because they stoned Stephen, God postponed the prophetic program and God inserted something in here that was not prophesied, which is the body of Christ. That was not prophesied in time past. But now he interrupted the prophetic program with an unprophesied program that he never spoke about before, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it is now known. And so now, here we are in the dispensation of grace. This is what God calls rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why God said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's the timeline over here, just to put a cap on this whole thing. Genesis chapter 1 to 11, right here. And then God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he institutes the nation of Israel. Moses gives them the law. David is the, is the picture of the kingdom that's to be fulfilled out there in the future. God makes a promise to Abraham. I'm, I'm separating you from all these Gentiles at the Tower of Babel, after the Tower of Babel. I'm separating you, and here's I'm going to make a promise. We're going to come back one day. We're going to bless all these people. We're going to come back and bless them. But right now, I've got to separate you, and I have to create a people that are worthy of my name, that will bring forth glory to my name. And they rebel, they reject, they, they're hard-necked, they're stiff-necked, they're hard-hearted. And then God stops speaking to them at the, end of three, at, the, at the end of Malachi for 400 years. There's no voice from God. There's nothing. All of a sudden, God breaks that silence with the voice of one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist. He says, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And he introduces Jesus Christ, the king who has come to sit on his kingdom and establish his kingdom. The kingdom's at hand. It's on your doorstep. But he came unto his own. His own received him not. He gave them a one-year extension of mercy. Peter preached to the, all the people of Israel for, seven, for that whole seven, seven chapters for a whole year. At the end of the year, they stoned Stephen. And it was then that God saved Saul of Tarsus. And gave him the revelation of the mystery. And Paul wrote Romans to Philemon. And Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles. Now somebody's speaking. To, nobody ever spoke to the Gentiles. Now all of a sudden, here comes one who speaks to the Gentiles. And when he says, I speak to you Gentiles, he says this. And there's no difference between you and the Jews. Today, the ground is even. At, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. If you're going to get saved today... You're going to be saved by grace, through faith, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, trusting that His blood is adequate and sufficient to forgive you of everything you've ever done, and you believe that, and God saves you, and you become a member of the body of Christ. Now, this is a temporary period of time in the Word of God. We don't know when it will end. But when it does end, it will end with the catching away. And God's going to catch His people out of here. And then God's going to resume His prophetic dealings with Israel right where He left off, right here. And the church is gone, so now we go back and we fulfill everything that was spoken by the prophets. This is all prophecy. And then the kingdom. Time passed, but now, ages to come. Your Bible is divided, just like your life is. Your life is divided in time past, but now? And what's to come? Matter of fact, everything is divided like that. Why should we think that the Word of God would not be in perfect keeping with the normal standard of the way things are measured? Why would we not think that? Why would we think that strange? Right? So we're going to continue now after this and we're going to go into the epistles that don't belong to the body of Christ called the Hebrew epistles which are found right here. Hebrews to Revelation are about Israel in the tribulation period. Not the body of Christ. Paul did not write Hebrews to Revelation. Paul wrote Romans to Philemon. 
Hebrews to Revelation has to do with the Hebrews going into the tribulation period. That's where we're going to go next, and we're going to look at those, and those are exciting as well. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time that we could spend in the Word of God. I pray that the words of this message will fall upon ears that are listening. Let him that hath an ear hear. And I pray that the words of this message will find soil that is receptive to the seed of the Word of God, that it will produce fruit, and that it will accomplish that which God pleases in the thing whereinto He sent it. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 